the best marker of disease susceptibility is the actual presence of the disease. And we know atherosclerosis has been underway for decades before it manifests itself clinically as a heart attack. In fact, Wald and Law in their Pulipil paper stated that 96% of all deaths from coronary heart disease or stroke occur in people aged 55 and over. And we know it's a disease that starts in young age and it progresses slowly. So we have all the possibility to detect the disease in a subclinical state before it gives rise to a devastating event. And if you go to the National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines, they in fact also said that, well, maybe we should focus a little bit, little bit more on subclinical atherosclerosis, in particular in the old age. We have said in this paper approximately two-thirds of first major coronary event occur in patients above 65 years. And in fact in older age, which factor is not very useful. Risk factor is not very useful in older age to, to identify people at high risk. It's better in younger age. So they suggest that measurements of subclinical atherosclerosis are promising in the older age group where most heart attacks occur. And they suggest to measure angle brachial blood pressure index, myocardial ischemia, carotid artery insulin thickening, or coronary calcification for subclinical atherosclerosis before a major event occur. There's another group of people where risk factor is not very predictive. It's female. And this paper was published last year. It was called evidence-based guidelines. I don't know if you have guidelines that are not evidence-based. I don't know about them. But in the title they want to stress here that we had evidence guidelines for cardiovascular disease prevention in women, 2007 updates. And they argue that in the older guidelines we have high risk, intermediate risk, lower risk, and optimal risk. And now they suggest we should only have high risk, third risk, and optimal risk. And the reason behind it, and here we have the table where the classification, high risk, third risk, and optimal risk, it's because we cannot risk stratify in such a way that we prevent heart attack in female. And here again they suggest evidence of subclinical vascular disease, for example, coronary classification, can be very useful in female that, based on risk factor alone, are not classified as high risk because all agree if risk factor classified a person as high risk, people are in general at high risk. The, the problem is with those that are not classified at high risk because most events occur in this population and they suggest here it could be an idea to think about doing coronary calcification or carotid intimal sickening with ultrasound. And we have this figure uh, where we have suggested some years ago some imaging tools that can be used to assess vascular function and disease in the arterial system. And it was published as these shape guideline, uh, when was it, two years ago? Yes, 2006, where we suggested maybe it would be an idea rather than measure risk factors for the disease, try to assess the disease, how much disease is present and see if it's above the average or do you belong to the top of the population, then your risk of having a heart attack maybe in 10 or 20 years will be increased compared to those that don't have the disease. It has been said they are not evidence-based guidelines. Well, we think they are evidence-based. Then the last point, evidence-based medicine, what's that? Well, a few years, a few uh, weeks ago, this paper was published in circulation evaluating the evidence. Is there a rigid hierarchy? And they suggest, or they mention this pyramid. I think most of us have in our mind when we would like to assess evidence. 
And on top of the pyramid is a randomized controlled trial. Then we have the evidence if we can randomize people. It's the highest level of evidence. That kind of evidence has been developed to test drug treatment. And it's probably also that it is the best evidence. But I think it's a misconception that lack of a randomized controlled trial is the same as lack of evidence. And some people use it in that meaning. Well, let's go back to the National Cholesterol Education Program again. They go through the literature, and we have the, pro we have the, the problem with lifestyles uh, uh, components or diet, for example. We have firm recommendations of lifestyle, smoking, exercise, diet. What is the evidence for these guidelines? Here, none of the trials on diet and ischemic heart disease provided convincing proof of the efficacy of serum cholesterol lowering by dietary means to reduce coronary heart disease risk. We don't have any randomized trial saying it's good to speak, to, to, to eat in a different way. Nevertheless, we have an evidence statement that an atherogenic diet is a major, a major modifiable risk factor for coronary heart disease. C1, the evidence is very strong. But it's not based on a randomized trial, it's just observational studies. So we have already a current guideline. We have strong evidence for some recommendations that are not based on randomized trial. In Europe, last year, we had the same problem by our guidelines. And we have here the European guidelines for cardiovascular disease prevention. Are they evidence? What about lifestyles component? And they discussed in the guidelines, it's very difficult to grade these different interventions in smoking, exercise, lifestyle, because there is no randomized trial. We have these classes of recommendations and levels of evidence. And because people usually say, if we don't have a randomized trial, we don't have good evidence, they decided in Europe, for this reason, after prolonged debate, the task, task force has not included the table of the grade that it prepared. So, in fact, we don't know the evidence as we have it in usual guidelines. Because most people will say if we don't have the randomized trial, we don't have good evidence. Well, there was this editorial. What is the evidence, in fact, for the risk scores we are using today? We, we use risk scores. You use Framingham in US. You use the score project in, in Europe. They are recommended. What is the evidence behind these guidelines? In this editorial, it was clearly stated, without exception, all risk prediction charts and risk score are based on evidence obtained in prospective observational studies. It's not any randomized trial. And a few months ago, we had this news and you in Jack Imaging, where they discussed imaging for coronary risk assessment ready for prime time. And Pamela Douglas stated here, no risk assessment strategy, not Framingham score, not biomarker such as high sensitivity C-reactive protein, not imaging has ever been proven in a randomized trial to reduce cardiovascular events and is unlikely ever to occur. And for some observers, this lack of evidence is a critical flaw. It's not lack of evidence. The evidence is very strong, but it's not based on a randomized trial. But it is as if some person had a double standard here, because this, this uh, introduction was followed by this comment by Rita Riedberg that stated, in fact, the cardiac risk factors described almost half a century ago by the Framingham investigators are still accurate today. The Framingham risk score has proven to be invaluable in predicting and helping to prevent heart disease. I agree. 
but it's not based on a randomized trial. It's observational studies. Therefore, may, I think it, it's some kind of double standard when you, as you do here, require when you have now another way to assess risk and you in observational studies have shown you can do it better than you are doing the risk for, then you will require before taking up this new risk assessment tool, you will have a randomized trial. And it's stated here, there is no study showing effect of CT on prognosis or on clinical event. Coronary calcification screening has not shown any the effect on clinical endpoint. There is lack of outcome data. It's correct. It's also correct for Franklin score. It's correct for all risk score. So it's not anything that applies specifically to risk assessment by imaging. And it was also recognized by this editorial by Color a few years ago, Prevention of Coronary Heart Disease and the National Cholesterol Education Program, where a major study suggested that people with a high calcium score with a low, low Framingham score should be randomized to, to have treatment or no treatment. Where he in fact say, if you have a high calcium score, you have a high risk and it's unethical to randomize such people. So there is problem with lifestyles, component, diet and so on to randomize people. Sometimes it's not possible, other times it's unethical, but we can have the evidence be even if we don't have a randomized trial. Then I have a few comments at the end because I also was uh, asked to talk about monitoring and response to therapy, but I think we'll hear about it later. It just to mention that uh, we know we had this forgotten majority a few years ago where it was stated despite statin ther therapy, two thirds still developed heart attack. It was at that time called the forgotten majority now we have what we call the residual risk. It's the same. You treat patients or people with the optimal therapy today, and despite optimal therapy with ACE inhibitor, statin, aspirin, and so on, you still have event. 60 to 70 percent of patients do experience an event despite the best available medical treatment today. So we have two problems. We cannot identify those at high risk, and those at high risk still develop event despite optimal therapy. And I think we'll hear more about it in the next presentations.